Right, I see a few familiar faces out there. How many of you have actually had your DNA done? Quite a few, yeah, okay. Um, this is not going to, um, well, it's not going to give you a lot of skills, but it will give you some clues about what you might want to do, and for those of you that have sort of worked a few things out, you'll probably be able to, or you can work it out, how you can go about doing it. Um, I'm a proud, um, I don't know, I don't know if that's the word, but Diploma of Family History from UTAS. I was in the, the first cohort that went through. Fabulous um, program, if any of you are interested in it. And I'm also the coordinator of the DNA interest group for the Hobart branch of the Tasmanian Family History Society. Um, we meet on the third Thursday of the month at 1.30 in the afternoon um, at St Mark's Church. It is in Belle which is opposite Salamanca Fresh. I'm not good one, not very geography. If you go to the Family History Society's Hobart Branches website and look at um, resources, I think you can look at DNA there and look at the information or there's an email address too that actually comes through to me. Got a good group that meets every month and um, I also do some individual um, consultations or whatever you call them <laughs> um, with people, just particularly people who've got a particular mystery that they're trying to work out, which is one of the ways I've come to solve a few of family history mysteries. So computers and the internet brought some um, huge changes to family history DNA research, uh, family history research, as you will well know. But I think after that, DNA testing has been the most exciting breakthrough in family history research. It's enabled people of all ages, but often older people, to break through brick walls in their family history research, sometimes with profound outcomes. Um, some of them, they've been able to identify an unknown parent or even two parents. Um, this is particularly for people who were adopted. Um, it can solve the mystery of an illegitimate parent or grandparent. Um, always wondered who Dad's parents were. He never knew and often he's long gone. Um, finding previously unknown cousins who can fill in the gaps of family history information that you don't have about one of the branches of your family. Um, cousins who have previously unseen family photos. That's the one that excites me. When I get to see people that I'm related to, I've never seen those photos. Or I've been actually probably more often able to help others with that. And finding you're related to people you already know, um, for better or worse, I can say. <laughs> I know someone who recently thought, my God, am I related to him? <laughs> I don't know that I want to be. Of course, this is Hobart too. Um, Another thing is for someone seeing a photo of your previously unidentified father for the first time, um, which can be pretty exciting if you've never known who he was, and meeting and getting to know half-siblings. This is not looking there, is she? <laughs> um, but there is a downside. If you're getting your DNA tested, be aware that you might find or might not find what you're expected to find. Your father might not be your biological father, and I've um, worked with someone who made that discovery. Um, one of your parents, your partner, or you, if you're a male, may have had children that you didn't know about. If you were sowing your wild oats. Um, it could be a child from a former relationship and one of my husband's cousins was actually contacted by that program, Find My Family, which was on, on uh, one of the commercial channels. Is it possible you fathered a child in such and such a year? And he thought hard and he said, well, if Kathy was the mother, it's possible. Would you be willing to take a DNA test? And he, he had never married and um, never had any children and was reunited with a son that he didn't know he had, who... Um, he recently died and his son has actually inherited his entire um, estate. So, And he formed a really nice relationship with his son, so that was good. Um, 
a child who was relinquished for adoption, sometimes people have given up a child for adoption or some other family members, um, or one or more children from IVF donor insemination. Um, if the males have actually perhaps donated their semen many years ago, they may discover that there in fact are now sometimes quite a number of children that they didn't know about. And some of those children can actually find them using DNA. Um, I recently helped someone who'd been adopted to identify her father, who was surprised as um, it was actually still alive in his 90s. Well, she was surprised to discover that. And a female cousin made the first approach to one of her father's legitimate sons, who she thought didn't know about his illegitimate daughter. And, oh yes, he said, he did know his father had had an illegitimate child. And they were having this conversation, and then she realised gradually that he was the, he, the, the son was talking about a he illegitimate child, and she was talking about a she illegitimate child. <laughs> and um, there was an illegitimate son as well. And when he was actually contacted, because they started thinking, well, we'll you know, make contact with people, he revealed, well, I've, actually, I've got a, a full brother who was adopted. Um, this guy, and he's still alive. <laughs> Um, living in Hobart in his 90s. He recently had his 92nd birthday and um, with all his children present, so three legitimate ones and two of his illegitimate children, the other ones overseas. So, um, but they had a big, big reunion. Um, it actually has worked well. Not all families are so welcoming, um, particularly when they made clear they weren't after anything. Um, they just wanted to get to know him. Um, and I could say that perhaps fortunately the father's wife is deceased because I think it would have been very hard for her to discover that her husband actually had... Well, apparently she knew he was having multiple affairs, but I don't think she knew about the children. So these are the DNA testing companies for family history. Each has different services and tools. Some may have ongoing costs. Um, Ancestry DNA has by far the biggest database of potential matches. It's by many millions more than anyone else, with a lot of people in Australia and New Zealand, which, and usually if somebody's thinking about getting their DNA, and I hate to recommend any companies, but Ancestry is the most useful because it's just got the most potential matches. So sorry. There are three types of DNA testing. Um, these, this is what I'm not talking about today. Y DNA, which identifies males only. It tests the father's 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 line back thousands of years. Um, theoretically, it follows the surname back to when surnames first came to be used. But there are lots of reasons why the surname you're trying to trace, if that's what you're trying to do, may not be what you expect. Um, very specialised and limited by the relatively few males who have tested. So it's often, if you try to find out who was my grandfather and you get Y DNA done, you might not be able to get a surname out of it. Um, the next one is mitochondrial DNA. Um, males or females can test, but it relates only to the direct female line, so the mother's 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 mother back thousands of years. Mitochondria changes very little over hundreds of years, so a very close match may in fact share an ancestor who was born 500 years ago, and it's generally not particularly useful. I have heard people that say there's specific things they were trying to work out, but the only thing you can find out if you really want to know is which of the seven daughters of Eve you're descended from, and <laughs> that might be useful. Um, this is the autosomal DNA, is a test that's popular and referred to as getting your DNA done. It's the only test offered by most of the companies, for example, Ancestry. Males and females can test, and it covers the DNA they've inherited from their paternal and maternal ancestors, so both sides. We inherit half from each parent, so each generation the amount of DNA is approximately halved and therefore autosomal DNA can only reliably go back about six or seven generations before it gets too diluted. Um, but that's, that's the test that I'll be talking about today. So what do you get from autosomal DNA testing? 
Um, you get an online account through which you can access your broad ethnicity estimates, regions or groups where your ancestors may have come from, usually from centuries ago. And this is what all the ancestry, for example, advertisements tell you, you know, oh, I'm X percent Scottish Irish and X percent Scandinavian and I've got a, got a bit of Ashkenazi Jewish in me. And um, a friend of mine who's actually has Chinese ancestor in Tasmania here, um, was really thrilled to actually find that she had a portion of Chinese DNA and um, was then able to actually use her DNA to link in with some people that she actually was related to through him. Um, this is a cartoon. For those of you up the back who can't see it, it says, I got one of those DNA kits. Turns out I'm 80%, 85% water, 8% dirt, and 7% dog pee. <laughs> um, when a group of people live in the same geographical area or cultural group for several generations, they tend to marry and have children with other members of the same group, and they start to share distinct segments of DNA which differentiate them from other groups. And that's the basis for ethnicity testing. Your ethnicity profile can help you identify where your ancestors lived 500 to 1,000 years ago. Um, each testing company uses their own formula, so if you have your results up with different companies, you will get different ethnicity. Um, some of it in common, but the percentages will be wildly different. It is still a very inexact science, so don't you know put too much on it. I, I you know, just as an example, I know I'm 25% Cornish. I have a Cornish grandfather who you know, goes back for generations in Cornwall. And yet, um, you know, some companies will give me like 15% Cornish and some of them will give me <coughs> other amounts. And it varies a lot. <coughs> some of them don't give me any at all, they just talk about Southern England. More importantly, you also get matches to other people whose results are on the same company's database and are related in recent generations. Um, this is a de-identified version of a list of matches. That's what they look like, except there's usually, if you keep scrolling down, there's 10 to 20,000 of them. The vast majority are so distantly related to you that it would be hard to make any sense of them, but certainly the closer matches are what you would be working with when you're trying to sort things out. At first, this list of people who are supposedly related to you can be totally overwhelming. Um, and your matches are listed by relationship, closest relations first, and each company presents them a bit differently, but essentially they've done the same thing. Same, same, same principles. If you're new to DNA, there are three basic concepts that will help you to interpret your DNA results. Understanding what a match is, it's a word I've been using already, and what a common ancestor is the amount of total DNA you share with your match and why that's important, and who else in your matches shares DNA with that match. So, a match is someone with whom you appear to share a common ancestor. Now, this is me down here pretending I was born in 1960, because that's <laughs> the table's actually adapted from Morris Gleason. And this is my match. And then, uh, these are our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents who would have been siblings. And then you get up to what are called the common ancestors, our great-great-grandparents. So we have the same great-great-grandparents and <coughs> if you work that out, it actually means that we're third cousins. When you select one of your matches, and in this example I've just got X, um, then when you click on a, a little tool called Shared Matches, sometimes it's called In Common With, but mostly it's Shared Matches, um, it brings up other people in your DNA matches who are also in X's matches, um, because they share the same bits of DNA that you and X share. So, you know, there's me there, and all of us have got some DNA in common. Um, 
The shared matches tool is one of the most helpful features available on your DNA matches. I suggest if you haven't already played with it that you do. Using share and on Ancestry, if you click on a match, it then brings up um, a couple of things and there's a tab that has shared matches and that will then show you who in your database is also in that person's database. You can't see other people in their database, your matches database, only the ones that you both share. So using shared matches you can work out how your DNA um, match might be related to you and you can learn more about um, often your family tree. Um, shared matches are especially helpful if you have an unknown ancestor or a brick wall or a mystery match who has no family tree. So what else do you get from autosomal te DNA testing? You get tools to analyse your data and the options vary with each country, with each company. Um, each one is, um, is different but for each match you can usually see an estimate of your relationship it's what the company thinks that you might be second or third cousin, fifth to remote cousin or whatever. Not necessarily how you relate, it's not necessarily accurate, it's just their guess. And you'll also see, and all of the companies will tell you this, the total amount of DNA that you share with that person. Um, I should just digress for a moment and say that all of these slides that I'm showing here have been de-identified. I've gone in and changed names and done things. Um, except for some that I'll mention later. But, um, so the total amount um, is actually the most useful. Some of them will also tell you the percent, but that's not, a, I don't ever use that, it's a particular thing. The amount of DNA is shared in a thing called centimorgans. Um, it's easiest to just understand it as a unit of measure. It's actually very complicated and I haven't entirely got my head around it, even though I work with it all the time. But it's just, if you just think of it as a unit of measure, it's, um, that's the easiest way to do it. And the more DNA you share with someone, the more closely you are related to them. Um, um, so extracting meaning from your, the amount of total DNA you share with your batch is really important. And in this case, I share 241 centimorgans across 11 segments. That's not so important. It sometimes is when you're working on it, but the 241 is the main figure that you want to know about. What is it as a percentage of? The percent? I mean, what is 241? Oh. It's just an amount, and if I look, if you look at the next, this chart can help you estimate your relationship with a, a match based on the total amount of DNA you share. It's available online to download for free, and there's also an automated version I'll show you. And this is the most useful tool to help you work out how closely you're related to someone and how many generations back the common ancestors might be. Um, and this guy has collected data from thousands of people, like I think 25,000 was the last count. So for people who know that they have a first cousin, you know, they've proven that this person is my first cousin. Uh, no. uh, and I'm just going. For a first cousin, the amount of DNA you would expect to share is 866 as an average, but the range is 396 to 1397 there. So that tells you how much DNA you would share. With a sibling, you'd expect to share 2,613. Um, a half sibling, 1,759 as an average. So that gives you a fairly good indication of the sort of relationship you can expect. And then if you go up from here, if it's a first cousin, then the common ancestor is likely to be your grandparents. Um, there's another version of this, which is this one, um, and this is on a, a website called dnapainter.com, which is a fabulous website, um, free tools, and up here you put in the amount of DNA that you share with someone, and it greys out all the things that aren't possible, and, and then it gives you down below some 
figures about you know, 80 percent likely it's this type of relationship and you know 50 percent likely it's this um, so that that's actually a really useful tool to use okay so shared matches how am I related to JB um, I've got this JB and we've got this um, who else shares DNA with me and with JB JB and all of the companies have a tool that helps you identify who your shared matches are um, and if I can identify just one person in the list of shared matches that I have with JB then and I think oh I know who you are and how I'm related to you then I know how I'm probably related to all the rest of those shared matches because, um, and I can narrow down which branch of my family. So, making sense of your shared matches. This is, <laughs> this is how it feels a bit. The most useful thing you can do, and this is usually the first thing I recommend to anyone who's got their DNA results back and are looking at them, is to sort your DNA matches into four groups, one group for each grandparent's ancestors. And you do this by using the shared matches tool. Um, generally speaking, you start with second cousins because the second cousin will be related to you by only, to only one of your grandparents. First cousin will be related to two grandparents, so you can't separate that. Um, this is sort of looking at my, my ancestry and I try and divide my matches, shared matches, up into those four groups. Um, and, and as I said before, if, the, um, if one person's related to you as a shared match, you can look at their shared matches, then you can look at their shared matches. Um, if you have unknown parents, and this is when I've been helping someone who doesn't know anything about either of her parents, doesn't know who they are, then the first thing I would try and do is if I can get some clue somewhere, is basically sort them out into father's and mother's matches. If you can do that, um, or if you know one parent, then you can sort out those and then the rest of them are probably going to be the paternal matches. <coughs> Ancestry very helpfully has coloured dots that you can use to differentiate different groups of ancestors. You can just allocate whatever colour you want. Um, in this example, I've allocated purple to my McLeod grandparent line, pink to the rose, blue to the Escots, and green to the Keos. Um, and when I and then if I do, like, if I've got lots of people with green dots, there is a tool up the top where it, groups where I can actually pull up all the ones that just have green dot beside them and then I can start exploring them. Um, this is actually based on what's called the Leeds method um, and you can do the same task with any of the other DNA companies but they don't have the very handy um, coloured dots. So for example my heritage, you need to use a spreadsheet to colour code um, your shared matches. So that is not, not as easy but it's doable. There is another little specialised tool called clustering, and this is getting into the more advanced tools, um, that groups your shared matches together in a nice little coloured chart. And in this example, the four clusters actually represent the four grandparents' ancestors. And if you can, and there's a list of names that I've blurred out on the top and the bottom, which sort of meet together. If you can work out any one person in a cluster and think, I know how I'm related to you, then you can actually work out how you probably relate to all the rest of them because it's 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 a it's a way of visualising shared matches essentially. Then the next thing that I like to do is build what's called <laughs> people call it a quick and dirty tree, also called a research tree. And this is one of the first things I do when I'm trying to untangle someone's DNA results to solve a mystery. Um, and I'm thanking Liz who's sitting up there for this tree. Um, it's the only one I've got here that um, isn't de-identified. And the reason it's not de-identified is because it's all in this book, which the library now has upstairs. No, yeah, upstairs, yeah. 
Um, so her secrets are out. Um, quick and dirty trees are where you take the tree fragment from a shared match. Sometimes they only have like, you know, a very small amount of information in there attached, the tree that's attached to them. And you build it out. You say, well, you haven't worked out who that person's parents are, but I'll try and work it out and see if you can build it out. It's called quick and dirty because you break all the rules of thorough genealogical research. You do dreadful things like copying other people's trees from ancestry, <laughs> which we know are often inaccurate. Um, I do try and verify, does this look like it's chunky or does it look like it might be okay? Um, if I'm building a quick and dirty tree, I always make it private if I'm doing it on ancestry and preferably non-searchable because it may well be inaccurate and I don't want anyone else thinking, oh, there we are, I'll copy all of that down, that looks good. Um, so you use trees and tree fragments from shared matches to build out to a common ancestor and down to matches. And then you try to build down on all lines the possible descendants um, who are the right approximate age and gender, if you know it, and who could possibly have been in the right place at the right time to participate in the conception. <laughs> so this is, I'm often trying to find fathers, so if I know or have a pretty good idea where the conception occurred, at least which state, you know, were they remotely possible, I'd rule out, you know, depending on the age of the female, I'd probably rule out very young boys and, you know, you can't rule out older men, you hope that they weren't involved. But, um, this is another one of my favourite and really useful tools. Um, one, once again, it's a fairly specialised tool. It's called What Are the Odds? Always abbreviated to Watto. And it's another tool that's on DNA Painter. You can build one of these trees on DNA Painter for free, but if you want to build multiple trees, then you need a subscription, which is fairly inexpensive. Um, and in this de-identified example, I built a tree for a branch of a family and added in all the DNA matches. So I sort of had done a quick and dirty tree and then I um, built the people down, added in the matches. I have to be really sure that I know where they fit because um, if you get them in the right place, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and sometimes you do make mistakes and you have to move things around. And then you start putting in hypotheses, or you actually ask it to suggest hypotheses. Um, and in this example, um, hypothesis one up the top has a score of 2,211, and it says that it's about 96 times more likely than the next hypothesis, which is this one here. Um, and in fact, um, it turned out to be that that's where the hypotheses are the person whose DNA you're working with, because these are all that person's matches. It's a fabulous tool. Um, it was a lot of work to get to this point in this particular case that I was working with, but it's wonderful when it really confirms what I've figured out um, or tells me that my theory is unlikely or impossible, and I think, oh, uh -oh I'll start again. Um, so it's a, it's a really good tool, that one. Okay, so using DNA to confirm your ancestry or to solve family history um, mysteries. This is a family member's tree, a family member of mine. I gave my cousin's daughter a DNA kit for her 40th birthday. With her permission, I never give anyone a kit before I ask, would you, would you like it? And she said, oh, that'd be really cool, you know. Um, this is a, a, what's called the circle chart. It, it's actually a, a family tree and she's in the middle here and then this is her parents on either side of it and then we go up to one grandparent, two grandparents, her, I think that's her mother's and this is her father's two grandparents. And then I've actually put these red lines in to show the sort of four quadrants for the grandparents. Um, I actually like making these trees, take them to office works and um, get them printed out and then I put little stars or stickers or felt pens or I often get them laminated um, against where I found um, common ancestors. So if I found someone else who's descended from these parent, people who's in my match, 
then I can say, right, well, I've actually confirmed that they are common ancestors and that that part of my family history research must be correct. Do you follow that? It's, um, so I put little stars or whatever I like where I've actually confirmed the ancestry. Um, I got terribly excited when I actually did this. I have um, only two convict ancestors who were a couple and they are descended from their daughter Mary and I matched with some people on DNA who were descended from their son James and someone else who was descended from their son George and I thought, wow, I really am descended from those convicts. It was just like, it made it so much more real to me. Like the paper record, you think, well, yeah, I appear to be, but it made it much more real to me. Um, in this case, I had plenty of stars confirming DNA matches with three of her grandparents, as you, as you can see, but none for her paternal grandfather. Um, and this suggests that to me that she may not be biologically related to him. Um, it is possible that he just comes from a family with a whole lot of small families that have had a bottleneck and nobody's interested in DNA testing. But in this day and age, particularly on Ancestry, where you get so many matches, it would be quite unusual. Um, her late father always said that his father was a bastard, and it seems he was right. Um, we ordered her father's, her grandfather's birth certificate. Um, I love getting things from Victoria. You just put, pay your money, put in, and you download your room thing about five minutes later. Um, all his siblings had his mother's husband recorded as their father, but he was born six years after the rest of them, and there is, where am I, no father, it's totally blank. So she was acknowledging that their father, her husband, was not his father. Um, and I also found, I was looking at electoral rolls, that her, she was living with her husband about two years before he was born, and then about two years after, which is the next electoral roll, he's not living with her. We actually have never found a death room, but we don't know what happened to him. But anyway, clearly she's saying he's not the father. What's also interesting with her is that there are no DNA matches to um, Emmy's um, fam family, the, mo the mother of the, ba the baby's family. Um, and the question is, is it too far back to reliably find DNA matches, or was she in fact not his mother? And um, then I noted that there were no witnesses to his birth. You probably can't read it, but there's a word up that this column says, Akusha, and usually it has Dr. So-and-so or Nurse So-and-so, not any. Now, it could have been a, an unexpected home birth or something or other. She says, name by who's certified and name and occupation of any other witness, and there are these two people. But I'm not sure how the system worked. Um, she bought Jack. Jack was present. She came in to register him. He was present. Whether the, um, the person who certified this person, whose name I can't quite read, um, was someone who certified or whether they were just people who were willing to put their names forward. Um, so she's turned up with a baby who she says is hers. No father's noted. And the question in our minds is, was she a naughty girl? Or was she a good girl who took in someone else's baby as her own and went down and registered it as her own child and raised that child as if it were her son? Um, so we haven't actually solved this mystery yet because <laughs> um, this has only happened in the last couple of weeks. However, we have found um, my cousin's husband has died, so he can't be tested but one of his siblings has agreed to have a DNA test and she'll be one generation closer because she's the son of um, Jack here. So more likely to pick up some useful matches. The, the matches that we might use are all too small and not useful. Okay. Now, Elizabeth Betty Donnelly, who's sitting back there, <laughs> Um, was born in May 1944 at Elam House in West Hobart. 
Um, and I, the reason I'm identifying her is because she's the one that oh, we've got the book about. Her mother was Eunice Joyce Donnelly. Her father was unknown, not on the birth certificate. Her mother was what was called back then deaf and dumb and mentally incapacitated. Actually, I think they use worse words than that, but we'll use that one. Um, she also had a few little, um, a few phys physical features that I actually did a bit of sleuthing around and I've got a medical background and it's highly suggestive that her mother had rubella or German measles while she was pregnant, which can lead to um, hearing loss and um, mental incapacity. Liz was um, adopted at around 18 months. She was put in a home and then by 18 months it was decided she was normal, hadn't inherited her mother's deficits. Um, she had an unhappy childhood, always made aware that she was adopted. adopted. Um, she, long story and I'm cutting it short, found her mother Eunice at the Royal Derwent Hospital when she, um, Liz was 36, and they had 10 years of visits and outings before Eunice died in 1990 from cancer. I probably should add here that, because this is the really sad bit, that. She and Eunice had been able to keep the baby and the records from Elam House is that she was still breastfeeding at about four months when the baby was actually then sent off to um, a home. And Eunice was told that the baby had died. And she still believed that this baby had died. And then all those many years later her daughter turns up and once she mentally worked out that it was her daughter she was over the moon about it. But you know, that, that was what adoptive mothers and what love relinquishing mothers were often told. I mean, there's a sad history about that. Um, for the next 29 years, Liz tried to find out who her father was. Um, and nearly two years ago, Liz came to see me. She'd been coming along to the DNA interest group, and I'd said, if any of you, you know, want to have a session to sort of try and solve some mystery, then you can contact me, and um, she did. Because um, she'd had her DNA done, but she'd had no success. So I got stuck onto it, and um, as she knows, I'm like a dog with a bone when I get onto these <laughs> cases. I just, I get stuck into it and often I have some pretty late nights on it. My, my excuse is that when I get a whole lot of names in my head, when I'm starting to work on it, I don't want to walk away from it because I might not remember all the names, my brain's getting older and I might not remember all the names the next morning so I often keep working on it. Um, it I won't go into the details of how I did it but it took me a bit more than 24 hours to work out who her father was and I started sending her um, midnight and after midnight emails <laughs> as I was getting closer and closer. Um, 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 so after 50 years of searching, Liz finally had a father and a mother and a complete family tree. And as I mentioned before, she now has a, um, a book that um, the library has purchased a copy, uh, two copies, I presume one of them is probably somewhere else. Um, and it's a book that we worked on together. Um, I did a lot of work particularly on her ancestors and she's got Oh, wonderful convicts and interesting people all over the place. It's, um, it's a massive sort of family history book. Taught me a lot about um, writing, publishing books. I want to do my own, so I learned a lot from that. Okay. Um, Barb is the next person I'm going to talk about. Um, and this was a sort of Australian, New Zealand um, mystery. Um, she contacted me because um, I'm doing a, I'm doing an Escot one name study, which is with the Guild of One Name Studies, where I'm trying to find every Escot who ever lived, and um, <laughs> it's in my spare time. Um, and she thought that she had Escots in her tree. Um, Barb was um, born in Wellington. She. Her mother gave a name, um, 
uh, gave her name when she was born, um, which has since been, um, and said that she was from a certain age and said that she was from Auckland. She didn't give the father's name, but she said he was from Auckland and he was a farmer and a few details like that. Um, they've told her that that person does not exist, that her mother had given a false name. So she doesn't know her mother or her father. She had a DNA done, and all her matches are not from New Zealand, they're from Australia. <laughs> um, and in fact, quite a few of them, if we worked out, were from a country town up that way. So I sort of said I'd work on it for her and try and see what I could work out. Um, it was challenging because I had nothing. I didn't have a father or a mother, I couldn't say, Right, well, we'll say these are your maternal matches, therefore all those are paternal. I didn't know whether I was looking for a, a woman of a certain age or a male of a certain age because I didn't know which was which. And all I could do was start sorting um, her matches into family groups. And it was unfortunately made extremely complicated by the fact that there were half sibling relationships. There were um, in fact, I don't think I would ever have really got, got to sort it out, but I, in the end, I, I made a cold call, phone call to someone up in this country town um, who had the surname that I was interested in. Um, she was the only one that did. And um, she was a woman, an elderly woman who was really chatty and wanted to talk to me for forever. forever. Told me all the gossip in the family, <laughs> in the town. And discovered that um, it was her husband, who was the family name that I was interested in, discovered that her, his parents had separated and her, his mother had gone on to have more children, but because she was legally married to him still, her surname was still Escott, therefore the children became Escots. Do you follow that? Um, and which is just the way the law is. And, um, and in fact, then I realised that if she went on to have more children, then he might have done the same. And in fact, she, this person had matches to people who said, I don't know, I was adopted, I don't know who my parents are. So, and there was just, it was a whole lot of stuff that people just didn't know how they fitted in. Um, I traced the Escott line that I was interested in back and discovered that in, back in the 1800s somewhere, a man called Hitchcock in Somerset had moved to Wales. And he clearly had a, no teeth I'd say, and a very strong West Country accent. And every child that was registered had a slightly different surname. And every census he had a slightly different surname. But there were some Escots living in the area and eventually the census and the birth people must have just decided Escott, that's what he's trying to say. Not Hitchcock, but Escott. And so thereafter, the family became Escott. So it was an interesting little addition to my, my study to discover these Hitchcocks who were now Escotts. Um, so we did a lot of working things out and eventually I worked out who her mother was. And she in fact had fairly close relation that um, she was able to make contact with and that person said she's still alive, um, she's living on her own, um, she's in her 80s but um, she's, you know, here's her address and phone number. And so the woman in New Zealand sat down to write what she said was the hardest letter she's ever had to write to a woman who gave a false name and didn't want to be known and sent it off and of course COVID had hit so she didn't hear and she didn't hear and, and eventually she said to me, I think I'm going to, when my daughter comes around at the weekend, I'm going to get her to phone her and I said, can I give you one bit of advice, you make the phone call because if she's rejecting, it might be the only time, the only thing you will have done is have heard her voice. And if your daughter's made the phone call, she won't have heard the voice. And I know someone who deeply regrets never having at least heard her mother's voice. 
Um, so she did make the final call, and the mower was in the middle of riding back to her, extremely excited to be found. And that's, I mean, amazing. Um, she had actually said to someone some years ago, I gave her daughter up for adoption in New Zealand and I'd like to find her, and they know it was told, well, that's virtually impossible. So she just given up hope was thrilled to be found. Um, she was able to tell her who her father was, someone that she was engaged to at the time. Um, long story about how it all worked out. Um, the father turned out to be the, the husband of the woman that I had phoned. And I had said, because I, I told this woman I was working on a mystery, and so I said I could phone her back. So I had to phone her back and actually tell her um, that it was her husband's child. That can't be possible, she said. You know, he's only ever been in a relationship with me and the girl he was engaged to, and she gave me the name, you know, before me, and that was the name of the mother of this person. Um, it was a very awkward sort of situation. Um, the husband was deceased, so it was long gone. Um, she felt awkward about it, but um, there was actually, and I've never been in this situation before, but um, the woman in New Zealand has had very early and ferocious breast cancer, early onset, um, was not expected to live um, and has, has a daughter. Um, and the two, her father's, yeah, her father's, her, her two half siblings in Australia have also had really early onset breast cancer of the sort where they were not expected to live. One's still going through treatment. Um, so, you know, the, and they don't have the BRCA gene, so they're actually really wanting to get good medical histories. It's the first time I've ever, people say, I want to know who my parents are because I want to know my medical history. But, and apparently the father's family are, were riddled with cancer, including breast cancer. And so there is a history there and they want to get to the bottom of it. Okay. Um, I really do exist. This is um, another story. Um, names have all been changed. Um, Gwenda was born in Tasmania in December 1942, which makes her, what, nearly... 79. 79, right, thank you. Um, to Cecily, a 17-year-old single mother. She was adopted by Sarah, an old and married sister of her mother. So her mother, mother's sister, maybe she knew she couldn't have any children because she certainly didn't, adopted this baby. And um, Cecily went on to marry and have five children who were Gwenda's cousins. And Gwenda was never told that she was adopted, um, but was always particularly fond of her aunt Cecily. And it was a feeling that was reciprocated because her aunt knew that it was her daughter. Um, after both of her adoptive parents had died, Gwenda saw a TV program on adoption and it prompted her to contact the adoption services here. Um, they said, were you adopted? And she said, well, I've got no evidence, but I've got a, a feeling I was. There's something just not right. I've got this feeling. Um, so anyway, they had a look and they said, yes, you were. Um, and she found out the truth of who her mother was because you could, could now get identifying information about your mother. Her mother was still alive, so she told her mother, Cecily, what she knew, that she knew she was adopted. Um, she asked, and her mother took it well, she was happy to talk about it. She asked who her father was, but her mother became very distressed, and so she backed off and she never asked again. She found out from various family members that her mother, as a 16-year-old, had gone to work for a family with a property in the Midlands, and from there she wrote home to say that she was pregnant. The mistress of the house up in the Midlands is reputed to have said, if I have to work my fingers to the bone, I will never have another young girl in the house again. Glenda and some of the, um, Glenda and some of the other family members had long suspected that her father was possibly the patriarch of the house, who would have been 44 at the time, and she was 16. Um, his son was too young to be considered. Um, could have been somebody else, but 
That was where the family had their suspicions. Her mother, um, Cecily, died um, last year and it was suggested to Gwenda that she might now be an appropriate time to use DNA to try and find out who her father was. And we met, she ordered a DNA test um, I started building a tree for her, she gave me all this information, someone in the family researched about her assumed father's family tree, so we had this great family tree for her. Eventually her DNA results came back um, and there were absolutely no matches to his long established Tasmanian branch of the family. And they were a big family so I was confident he could be excluded. He was not her father, and I sort of said, phew, and in fact, that was the first bit of information I said to her. Look, you're not, he wasn't your father. <laughs> so using shared matches, I sorted her matches into maternal and paternal lines, identifying them with pink and blue dots. Um, first, I identified who was on her maternal line, so I could see who wasn't, and therefore more likely to be on her father's line. And I built a... a and dirty tree, I use shared matches, I use the Watto, that one that calculates the hypotheses and the odds. And um, she had a, a very close match um, with someone I'll call Gordon, who she shared a whopping 1,851 centimorgans with. Um, but he had no tree. And for those of you who've got good memory for numbers, 1,851 is very suggestive of a half-brother. Um, a legitimate world, and he turned out to be a legitimate son of her father. Um, I don't usually um, get involved as an intermediary. I think it's not my role and it's, it's not appropriate. But in this case, I, um, I did contact the half-brother's um, niece, Elaine, as Gwenda doesn't use computers at all. And she said, could I do that? And I think I've got... Yeah. Um, this is a reply from um, the niece. Hi Ros, I'm so incredibly shocked and happy to hear this news. I believe Gwenda is Brian's daughter. From what the DNA results say, Brian was my grandpa. From what the DNA results say, Brian was my grandpa and he passed away in the early 2000s. Gordon is my uncle. Brian had five boys and there was a baby girl born in 1943 who died when she was three months old. And We've since worked out that she was actually conceived two weeks after Gwenda. 16-year-old local girl, shotgun marriage. He was a bit of a lad, this guy. <laughs> um, and so even if Gwenda had perhaps wanted to marry him, um, I think she wasn't the local girl and this girl was the local girl. Their families had already decided that, you know, they're getting married and that's it. And she was um, shunned. Um, I spoke to my uncle Gordon this morning and he said he would send you an email. To say that he was shocked is an understatement, but so happy and excited, Elaine. And then I got an email from him. Yes, it appears Gwenda is my half-sister. How exciting. I'd love to catch up with her. Which is, I mean, you always hope for those sort of endings. You, you cannot assume that they'll happen. Um, Gwenda and Gordon spoke on the phone several times and then they met up. Um, they get on really well and he has accepted that, um, he's accepted her as a sister, um, particularly since he was one of five sons and the only girl in the family was the one that had died of three months of cop death or something. Actually, interestingly enough, we don't know what she died of, the, one, the girl who died of three months, except that Gwenda told me she has cystic fibrosis in her family, which she thinks she, gets from, she doesn't get from her mother's side. So. Um, whether, whether that's what it was, we don't know. Um, Gwenda's comment when I told her um, who her father was and sent her a copy of her family tree, I just thought it was so profound. She said, I really do exist. Which to me is just like, is a way of just saying how amazing it must be to find who your father is when you're um, close to 80. Um, she was very relieved to know that it was not the old man of the house in the Midlands um, having his way with her mother um, and that she's gone on to have a really nice relationship with her half-brother and I think she's met some of his other brothers too. And 
that's the end of what I've got today. Um, I don't know whether we've got time. We've got a few minutes for a few questions or questions. Yeah.